Ladies and gentlemen, the following segment of the podcast is presented exclusively by Hillsdale College. For over 175 years, four purposes have defined Hillsdale's mission, learning, character, faith, and freedom. Thank you for listening and my sincere appreciation to our brothers and sisters at Hillsdale for their great sponsorship. He's here. He's here. Now, broadcasting from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. Our number, 877-381-3811, 877-381-3811. There is no verdict from the jury. And I do not intend to tell you that one might be coming any moment in order to keep you here. I hope you'll stay here because of the substance of what we do. Obviously, when we get a verdict, I will immediately inform you of it, as will everybody else. So there's no reason to leave. I don't know how this will end. Nobody does. I'm a little concerned at the length of time this has taken, to be honest with you. But uh, time will tell. We shall see, and I'm not going to speculate. I just pray to the good Lord that this young man is, uh, is not found guilty of any of these charges. Because you and I both know that any one of those people pursuing him would have killed him. And we also know that the rioters have been killers in the past, and we further know that the three people who were shot were all, all had lengthy criminal records. But my question to you is this. Just how corrupt do a media organization have to be? Just what will it take for Comcast to take a good look at MSNBC as well as NBC? And what will it take for AT&T to take a good look at CNN? This from Fox. MSNBC skips Kyle Rittenhouse defense's closing argument after airing prosecutor's case to the jury. Joseph A. Wolfson. CNN also skipped the first hour of the defense's closing argument. Now, why would they do that? Why would they do that? MSNBC snubbed the defense team of Kyle Rittenhouse during closing arguments on Monday after airing the prosecutor's case to the jury that the 18-year-old was guilty of murder. Rittenhouse's trial is coming to a close after weeks of intensity in the courtroom, with prosecutors arguing to the jury that he intended to kill Rosenbaum and Huber, as well as Gross Krauts, who survived following the altercation. The defense argued Rittenhouse was acting in self-defense. We all saw it. But after hours of coverage dedicated to the prosecutors, both MSNBC as well as CNN opted out of covering the kickoff of the defense team's closing argument, airing the White House ceremony of President Biden signing the bipartisan infrastructure bill into law. Following some on-air analysis of Biden's legislative achievement, big deal, they celebrate in Washington when they spend your money, when they uh, impoverish future uh, generations, And they centralize power in Washington. They celebrate, the media celebrate, and we're all screwed. CNN returned to the Rittenhouse case, missing the first hour of the defense's closing argument. Meanwhile, MSNBC returned to its normally scheduled programming with deadline White House host Nicole Wallace 
hyping Trump ally Steve Bannon's surrender to authorities after he was indicted for defying a congressional subpoena. And I might add, in hour two of this program, second hour, the next hour, we'll have David Schoen on the program. He is Steve Bannon's lawyer, and he was one of the president's lawyers in the impeachment hearing. MSNBC contributor Jason Johnson compared Rittenhouse to a school shooter and even declared him the enemy, while analyst John Heilman, hi Heilman, said he was arguably a domestic terrorist who crossed state lines with the intent to shoot people. Morning Joe co-host uh, claimed Rittenhouse, well actually Joe Scarborough, claimed Rittenhouse was just running around shooting and killing protesters. What a dark dystopian scene where a 17-year-old boy is carrying around a rifle, running around and gunning down protesters, Scarborough added. So if you're just watching MSLSD or the Constipated News Network, you have no idea of what the facts are. And every one of these individuals, if they spent any amount of time watching what took place in this trial, know what they're saying are damnable lies. Damnable lies. And this is what's become of the American media, corrupt to its core, racist to its core. Black, white, doesn't matter who the host is, who the guest is. Look at Scarborough, was a repubic. Look at this Nancy Wallace, Nicole Wallace, was a repubic. So you have these repubics, repubicans, who will do anything for money. They're grifters. They've hanged around Washington, hang, they hang around New York, in this case, Northern Jersey. They can't make money any other way. What can Nicole Wallace do or Joe Scarborough? Joe Scarborough tried radio. He and uh, what's her face? Oh, yes, Mika. They failed at radio. They couldn't make it. They said they're going to take a little sabbatical and rework their content. Well, they never came back because nobody wanted to hear from them. So Scarborough figured out quickly, <clears throat> join them. That's how to make money. I'm a failed politician. I'm a failed radio host. So that's Scarborough. What else can I do? I'll throw in with the left. Nicole Wallace, same thing. After sabotaging Sarah Palin with McCain, she became a regular commentator on MSLSD. Trashing her party, trashing Trump, trashing every Hey, she's good. And of course, they give her a job as a host. But there is no excuse, none whatsoever, for a news organization owned by Comcast to intentionally censor, censor, excuse me, critical aspects of this trial, the Rittenhouse trial, trial and there's no excuse for these same hosts to make the comments they're making, which are bald-faced lies. And you would think after the Russia collusion disaster for the media and the country, you would think that after that, these news organizations would recalibrate, would regroup, would, would have some kind of circumspection, but they have none because they're not news organizations. They're propaganda operations. And MSLSD... NBC, they're among the worst. They're among the absolute worst. So not only should this kid never have been charged at all, but he's being destroyed in the media. So when he is, or if he is cleared, what kind of life will he have? What kind of life will he have? This is what the media do over and over and over again. To young people even. This is what they do. If they can't beat you, they destroy you, or at least they try to destroy you. Look what they've done to Trump and his family, tried to destroy him. By the way, that fat slob Chris Christie is everywhere. He's been on MSNBC, he's on CNN, trashing Trump. This is his routine. This is his slimeball routine. No, I'm, I'm still friends with Donald Trump, and... Nobody, I'm, not, I'm second to nobody in terms of supporting Donald Trump and giving him advice and so forth and so on. But when he's wrong, he's wrong. And I, Chris Christie, I'm self-righteous. I, I, I'm a narcissist. I know when he's wrong, and when I speak up, I will tell you that he's wrong. So what he's doing is he's, war, he's walking a tightrope. 
All 412 pounds. He's on the high ro- on the high row. On the high wire. And then he says, they're never Trumpers, you know. Ronald Reagan threw out the, uh, the Birchers and, you know, maybe we'll have to throw out the never Trumpers. 75 million people voted for Donald Trump. Are they all John Birchers? You're going to throw them all away? Chris Christie is going to destroy the Republican Party. Let me tell you why. He's getting his orders from Fred Ryan, the head of the Washington Post, believe it or not, who also runs the Reagan Library. Can you believe that? He's getting his orders from the other Ryan, the former speaker. He's getting orders from the Bush family, from the Cheney family. He's a Northeast Rhino. He was, he's sort of the Scranton, if you will, um, you know, uh, Romney, his father, those kinds of Republicans. That's what he is. He's not a Reagan guy. What did he do for Reagan? never did anything for Reagan. He's appointed U.S. attorney by a Bush. So basically, he wants the Republican Party to return to its establishment roots. He has no idea what's swirling around. Now he's written a book. I'm going to monitor how many books he actually sells. He's all over the, the propaganda media. They, they can't wait to have him because they go right after Trump. And so we have these saboteurs again, as we did in 2016. But in this case, this clown pretends he's pro-Trump. How many votes did he get in New Hampshire? He likes to talk about he got 61% of the vote when he ran for re-election. Then when he left, he had 19% approval. Couldn't get elected dog catcher in New Jersey today. Trump got 75 million votes. That's what's reported. So it's said to be official, right? 75 million votes, that's the second highest in American history. How many votes did Chris Christie get in New Hampshire? Remember, he drew the line in New Hampshire because he decided he couldn't win in Iowa. He wasn't organized well enough. I could just see this blowhard, this bully. Couldn't you? Think people would be attracted to him on the campaign trail? No, I don't think so. But the same media that is undermining this country embraces Chris Christie. Why is that? The same media that's undermining this country embraces Liz Cheney. Why is that? Well, we know the answer, don't we? Kyle Rittenhouse running around shooting people. Scarborough. What a low life, truly. Or he's a domestic terrorist. Oh, this is racist. You ought to listen to my monologue that I gave on Life, Liberty, and Levin on Sunday. You should listen to that monologue. It's online. We've posted it on my social sites. Because I make it abundantly clear there, as I've had for years, that the media in America is anti Semitic, it's racist, and it hates the country. It is dividing the country. It is setting off fuses. It is encouraging riots. It is encouraging violence. Along in many respects with the most radical elements of the Democrat Party. That's what the media have become. We don't have a free press. We have a tyrannical press. I want to have a free press, but we don't have that. We have a tyrannical press with few exceptions. Very few. And they run in the same pack. They have a pack mentality. They run in the same pack. They say the same things and they do the same things. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. American history and civics education is at a turning point. Will we allow bureaucrats and lobbyists to choose what school children are taught, or will we teach the whole truth? My friends at Hillsdale College argue for teaching the truth. They've made the Hillsdale 1776 curriculum downloadable for free at levinforhillsdale.com, available not only to teachers, but also to citizens just like you to share with other concerned Americans. This complete K-12 history and civics curriculum, designed to give educators guidance, not man 
mandates allow students to learn the tragedies and triumphs of American history as it really happened. Only through a complete and honest study of our history can students fully understand the world in which they live. Our children deserve to be taught the truth through a sound curriculum that was created by teachers, not bureaucrats, and upholds the dignity of each individual. America's future depends upon an honest, candid look at our history. Download Hillsdale's 1776 curriculum for free today at levin for Hillsdale.com. You know, uh, it's interesting, these press people. We have an aristocracy in this country. We have an aristocracy in this country that primarily lives in the Washington, D.C. area, which is where the government hub is. And I'm not talking about bureaucrats or private... I'm talking about the press and politicians. We have an aristocracy in and around New York. Wall Street, in some cases. And again, the press. And we have an aristocracy that uh, lives and works in and around Los Angeles. These three metropolitan areas, they're the tail that wagged the dog. The dog being the rest of the country, everything in between. And that's why you have somebody like Nancy Pelosi just north of Los Angeles. She's the longtime speaker. You have somebody like Schumer. He's the majority leader for the Democrats. You have enormous influence by individuals mostly elected on the East Coast or the West Coast who become chairman of these committees and push this agenda that is rejected by the center of the country. That is why you have people like Chris Christie and Nicole Wallace and uh, Republicans like that who are perfectly comfortable with MSNBC and CNN, perfectly comfortable moving in and out of these sort of these, uh, these ideological social scenes. No problem. What's the big deal? Chris Christie has spent his entire career trying to appeal to the New York Times trying to appeal to the New York Times. But it's not just him. When these people are in Washington long enough, they spend most of their careers trying to appeal to the Washington Post, the same as the New York Times, really, or the LA Times on the West Coast. That's their audience. The press is crucial. Why do you think they have press secretaries or they have communication directors to work with these Propaganda platforms. Now, whereas Chris Christie has shown up on Nicole Wallace's show on MSNBC, shown up on CNN, Mr. Producer, do we not reach out in various ways to Chris Christie to come on their show? And we never got a response, correct? Now, what does that tell you, folks? Chris Christie hates the base of the Republican Party. The Reagan base, the Tea Party base, the Trump base. He hates the base of the Republican Party. He's perfectly happy to run in a heavy Democrat state, move left, try and attract as many people as he can from the suburbs and so forth to vote for him, particularly the suburbs outside of cities in New Jersey. That's not a recipe for a victory nationwide. It's not even a recipe for a victory in New Hampshire, where he had to drop out because he was so lousy. I'll be right back. American history and civics education is at a turning point. Will we allow bureaucrats and lobbyists to choose what school children are taught, or will we teach the whole truth? My friends at Hillsdale College argue for teaching the truth. They've made the Hillsdale 1776 curriculum downloadable for free at levinforhillsdale.com, available not only to teachers, but also to citizens just like you to share with other concerned Americans. This complete K-12 history and civics curriculum, designed to give educators guidance, not mandates, 
mandates allow students to learn the tragedies and triumphs of American history as it really happened. Only through a complete and honest study of our history can students fully understand the world in which they live. Our children deserve to be taught the truth through a sound curriculum that was created by teachers, not bureaucrats, and upholds the dignity of each individual. America's future depends upon an honest, candid look at our history. Download Hillsdale's 1776 curriculum for free today at levin for Hillsdale.com. He's driving the media mad. Mark Levin, call in with your outrage. 877-381-3811. Now listen to this. I'll bet nobody's talked about this. I don't know. But this is uh, the free beacon, Chuck Ross. Bush Family Scoring sponsors event with blacklisted Chinese company. A scoring of the Bush family, is, in other words, a member, is lending his influence and family name to boost a Chinese government contractor blacklisted by the U.S. government for its links to the Chinese military. Neil Bush, the son of the late George H.W. Bush and the brother of George W. Bush and the brother of Jeb Bush, is a co-sponsor of the International Symposium on the Peaceful Use of Space Technology that begins November 18 in Beijing. Three co-chairmen of the forum are executives with the China Aerospace Science and Technology Corporation, that is CASC, a state-controlled contractor that builds China's military and space equipment. A subsidiary of CASC reportedly developed a hypersonic missile that the Chinese military tested in August, American official called the nuclear-capable missile a national security crisis because of its ability to evade American detection. Bush's sponsorship of the Space Symposium adds a veneer of respectability to the event amid growing concerns that China's increasingly aggressive military and space activities. The Trump and Biden administrations have prohibited American companies from doing business with CASC, because of its position in the Chinese military industrial apparatus. The Australian Strategic Policy Institute, which tracks China's military activities, rates CASC as very high risk to foreign nation security because of its links to China's military and intelligence services. Bush has extensive business ties in China and has worked closely with some of the country's propaganda organizations. He chairs the George H.W. Bush Foundation for U.S.-China Relations, which is co-sponsoring the Space Symposium. The Bush Foundation received $5 million in funding in 2019 from the China-United States Exchange Foundation, a leading think tank in the Communist Party's propaganda network. Bush's business partner, the Chinese real estate investor Wang Tianyi, is executive chairman of the Space Symposium. Bush is basically a power broker. He's an access point for the Chinese to leverage, said Brandon Weikart, a space security analyst and author of the book Winning Space. Weikart said the space symposium follows the classic Chinese model of using academic and business forums to recruit experts and investors in the West. He said one of their big missions is to get Western talent and investment to come to China to do cutting-edge research and development. A spokesman for the Bush China Foundation said they are not concerned by CASC's links to the Chinese military, saying that the symposium will focus on the development of space technology for use in the healthcare industry. You believe this crap? We're not concerned because it's not relevant to the content of this particular conference, which is unrelated to Chinese military and instead focused on global space technological advancement and rule setting, said Leslie Reagan the communications director of the Bush China Foundation. She said the Bush, that Bush does not have a financial interest in the space symposium and that neither he nor the foundation are paid to take part in the event. American policymakers disagree about whether the United States should collaborate with China on space exploration. They do. And it goes on in great detail. This is another reason they hate Trump, by the way, because Trump put his foot down when it came to communist China. He put his foot down. Now, the Bidens have made money off of communist China. The McConnells have made money off of communist China. Feinstein's husband, I don't know where she is anymore. Um, 
Her husband made a fortune off of communist China. The Pelosi's have made money off of communist China. And the Bush family has always been big advocates of communist China. Wasn't the old man an ambassador to communist China? I think he was at one point. Now what do you think about that, ladies and gentlemen? Bipartisanship, right? Well, guess who blew up that bubble? Trump. Said enough is enough. They're a huge problem. They're trying to destroy us financially. They're stealing our technology. Look what they're doing militarily. And he imposes uh, sanctions on them and tariffs on them. Man had guts. And by the way, the man could see the future of what would take place with communist China. I'm going to tell you a little secret. What's today? Tuesday, I guess? I will be flying to Florida on Thursday. I will be interviewing President Trump on Friday for Life, Liberty, and Levin on Sunday. He's asked me to come down and talk to him. He's got a project he wants me to discuss with him in front of you. I don't know all the details. But we will do that. I don't often have Donald Trump on my TV show. This will be the second time in almost six years, I think, or five years. Um, But of course, I was more than happy to do it. And I think one of the things I'd like to do is discuss his presidency. You see, you don't get that from the Chris Christie's, from the Paul Ryan's, from the Fred Ryan's, from the Peggy Noonan's, and all the other reprobates. His presidency was a huge success. A massive success. I mean, look, look at the mess now. Absolute disaster. So this will be something I'm going to do. I was going to wait toward the end of the week, but why should I hide that? Why should I hide that? And so I'm happy to, uh, to go down there and do that and look forward to it very, very much. But isn't that interesting? That one of the Bushes is very, very tight with China. The Bidens are tight with China. Pelosi's, China. McConnell's. Peter Schweitzer has done unbelievable reporting on this. China. Look at Swalwell. Look at Swalwell, would you? Still on the Intelligence Committee? How do we know he wasn't bought and paid for? How do we know he wasn't bought and paid for? Probably was. And he comes cheap, I understand. Very cheap. Now, there's a lot more to get into here. You had Alejandro Mayorkas at a hearing today in front of the uh, Senate Judiciary Committee. And many of you have probably heard by now, Ted Cruz really did a number on him. So did Mike Lee. So did Lindsey Graham. In fact, so did all the Republicans. Little Dick Durbin's out there going on about a pathway for citizenship for undocumented workers because it's critical to our economy because, you see, we need more workers. Excuse me. We're at the lowest level in decades on worker participation. Don't you think the same welfare state and the same disincentives to working would apply to people coming into this country? Foreigners coming into this country? It amazes me. The Democrats never want to try a little bit of capitalism. They never want to preach hard work and personal responsibility. They never want to reduce the welfare state. They always want to increase it. It's a damnable party. It's like a foreign party in America. It's a party that belongs in some backward European country. It doesn't even understand the nation. It doesn't even understand the purpose of this nation. Oh, the progressives are me. They're not progressives. Bayala or whatever the hell her name is and the rest of They're Marxists, not progressives. Stop using their name. They are exactly what I say they are. So what we'll do is take a little break, then we'll jump into this hearing today, and there's a lot more to get to as well. I'll be right back. Mark Levin. Uh, 
American history and civics education is at a turning point. Will we allow bureaucrats and lobbyists to choose what school children are taught, or will we teach the whole truth? My friends at Hillsdale College argue for teaching the truth. They've made the Hillsdale 1776 curriculum downloadable for free at levinforhillsdale.com, available not only to teachers, but also to citizens just like you to share with other concerned Americans. This complete K-12 through history and civics curriculum, designed to give educators guidance, not man mandates allow students to learn the tragedies and triumphs of American history as it really happened. Only through a complete and honest study of our history can students fully understand the world in which they live. Our children deserve to be taught the truth through a sound curriculum that was created by teachers, not bureaucrats, and upholds the dignity of each individual. America's future depends upon an honest, candid look at our history. Download Hillsdale's 1776 curriculum for free today at levin for Hillsdale.com. The, uh, the Russians are amassing their army on the border with Ukraine. The Chinese are more aggressive in threatening the island of Taiwan, the country of Taiwan, than ever before. The Iranians are ignoring every effort by the appeasers, Biden and his people, to come to the table to negotiate, to negotiate what we don't know. Nothing enough to negotiate. While the Iranians are selling 500 million barrels of oil to the communist Chinese in violation of worldwide sanctions. You see, ladies and gentlemen, here's the deal. As soon as Joe Biden came into office and he brought this guy Blinken with him and he brought Austin with him, he put this national security advisor with him and all these people. Our enemies knew. Our enemies knew that they were in for a, uh, a good ride. And that if they were going to act, they would have to act during this presidency. They were rooting for Joe Biden's election as they were rooting for Hillary Clinton's election. They wanted nothing to do with Donald Trump. Like the American Marxists in our own country. And the never Trumpers in our own country. Now, Joe Biden has created this situation, and what happened in Afghanistan put an exclamation mark behind the fact that our enemies were relatively free to do what they want to do. I mean, after all, if the Taliban can do it, Xi's looking at his own military and saying, gee, they're nothing compared to us. Putin's looking at his military and says, oh, the Taliban's nothing compared to us. And Iran saying, we don't have to compare ourselves to anybody. We're going to get nukes, and there's not a damn thing Biden's going to do about it. He's not going to attack us. And he won't back Israel if Israel attacks us. We are in uh, very treacherous waters right now. Very, very treacherous waters. Appeasement encourages provocation. And that's what you're looking at. You're looking at massive spending, trillions and trillions of dollars. Do you know the, the deficit for this year alone has reached $2.7 trillion and we haven't even finished the year? That in addition to the $1.9 trillion the Democrats passed when Biden came into the Oval Office, and the $1.25 trillion they're spending now, and the multiple trillions they want to spend now and in the future with the next one, we still haven't passed a budget. And Biden is proposing a $6 trillion budget, which is more than the trillion dollars over what the last budget was. The havoc that he is going to unleash on our economy, you're just tasting a tiny bit of this. The ideological advances they're trying to make, whether it's our schools or our military, brainwashing them. The open borders, we've now had over 2 million people trying to get into this country, some successfully. 2 million! 2 million! That's bigger than the city of Philadelphia. Trying to get into this country, and about 400,000 
have come into this country illegally and are unknown, walking our streets. Walking our streets. Now, the kind of money we need to spend on research and development when it comes to our military, we now have people in our military who are on food stamps, people in our military who are having to go to these food banks to eat. And this isn't the first Democrat president under whom our military has suffered like this. They're being taught Marxist, racist ideology. This is, this is a big problem we have here, folks. They want our military to be soft. They want our military to be ideologically hard left. And God forbid if we're attacked, they want our military to go to war without the proper weaponry and support. China sees this. China is on the move. Xi has the ambitions that Hitler had. Now, he'll use different tactics to conquer different parts of the world, choking people off, economic blackmail. We have not modernized our nuclear arms or nuclear uh, missiles. I've told you this. Russia has modernized now almost 80% of their nuclear missiles. China is bound by no agreement. China is now busy building as many nuclear whip- missiles as they can. They're moving towards 2,000 warheads. Their hypersonic technology, they stole it from us, they built upon it, is more advanced than ours because we're not putting the research and development in. We're busy spending trillions and trillions of dollars on other stuff and opening our borders to illegal immigrants. And rather than celebrating and encouraging the private sector, we're going to regulate it and tax it to the point that it cannot compete. I'll be right back. He's here. Now, broadcasting from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. Hello, America. Mark Levin here. Our number, 877-381-3811. 877-381-3811. So the media narrative at first was that Rittenhouse was a uh, white supremacist. But they couldn't find anything to support that. Then the narrative was he was trying to hunt down people, just shoot them. Like a school killer or shooter. Well, the facts don't show that. So they've now set it on, he's a vigilante. Even though the facts don't support that. He's a vigilante. Now what about the rioters? Are they not vigilantes? What about them? Are they not people who are potentially killing people, and in some cases actually killing people? This is why I'm so focused now on the media. It's why I wrote a book on freedom of the press. If you read that book, you'll get it, the whole thing. I don't mean just by watching it, but why these things are taking place. In effect, the Democrat Party is the media, and the media is the Democrat Party. And they all embrace this radical American Marxist ideology. Many of them are from a uh, younger generation, Radicals in the past, they've worked for Democrats, so they've worked for causes, but they've gone through the, the propaganda mill that has defined our colleges and universities now. They're being taught to promote this kind of uh, Marxist activism. Don't go for impartial. Don't go for objective. No, 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 that's not the profession anymore. And if they, of course, they embrace as American Marxist Saul Linsky, who I've talked to you about for 20 years on the radio, and Cloward and Piven, and the others. And when it comes to Saul Linsky, I've spent, I would say, over the course of my career, days worth, if you add it all together. But that became particularly 
poignant for me, as I've told you in the past, because when I was a young guy, I uh, just turned 23, and I joined the Reagan administration. And initially, I was in an agency called the Action Agency, which we got rid of. They don't do that anymore. They had a program called VISTA. They still have it. And as I've described before, uh, VISTA was run by a radical, March to Bankin. She now works with uh, other radicals. And she runs a PAC, I think, or whatever she does. Sam Brown used to be head of this group called Action. He was part of the uh, Students for Democratic, uh, you know, whatever, society. One of those groups. And um, we needed to do something about this. This is supposed to help people get out of poverty and so forth, but that's not what it became. It became a hard left ideological operation. And as I went down to the office, being the only Reagan guy who was there at that point, I think it was December 1980, right after the election, I opened some boxes and then I found boxes and boxes and boxes of this book called Rules for Radicals. Thousands of paperback copies. Now, I didn't know who Saul Linsky was, but I figured it out quite quickly, and I read the book. People like to talk about this book, but they actually haven't read it beginning to end. It's a small book. It's in plain English. It's, it's rather incoherent, but nonetheless, it has the points in there. This book that you paid for was being distributed throughout the inner cities. By the federal government, at, fe- at your expense, taxpayer expense. I can only imagine what's in these tr- multi-trillion dollar bills that they're passing or want to pass, additional bills. So you see this playing out today. Kyle Rittenhouse has to be destroyed. Donald Trump has to be destroyed. Anybody in talk radio with an audience has to be destroyed. Fox News has to be destroyed. Newsmax, OAS has to be destroyed. And conservative talk radio, of course. That's why I have no stomach and actually contempt for Republicans who join in on this because they want to be part of the in crowd. It's not an in crowd. In the least. No Republican with self-respect would go on with Nicole Wallace. None. She's a fraud. So why would you do that? Because you're a self-promoter, that's why. Egomaniac. So I wanted to point this out. And uh, so the rest of the conservative media will point it out as well. Alejandro Mayorkas is uh, the Secretary of Homeland Security... And, of course, he doesn't believe in homeland security, so there's an irony. He was deputy secretary under Obama, and he learned well under Obama. His family, Cuban immigrants, but he doesn't seem to learn a lot from them because Cuban Cuban immigrants are quite conservative. They love this country. And Ted Cruz put it to Mayorkas very, very well, and I'm going to let this play out without interrupting it. It's about almost two minutes. Cut one, go. How many children have been in the Biden cages in calendar year 2021? Um, uh, Senator, I uh, respectfully disagree with um, your use of uh, the term cages. Fine. You can disagree with it. How many children have been in the Biden cages? I've been to the Biden cages. I've seen the Biden cages. How many children have you detained at the Donna Tent facility in the cages you built told kids? How many children have been in those cages? Uh, uh, Senator, I can uh, uh, provide to you the following uh, figure that um, when and let me let me say that when a child I, I don't child, I, 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 it's a simple question how many children I, have been in those cages uh, I, I respectfully am not familiar with the term cages and to what you are referring there are enclosures in which they are locked in in which I took photographs and put them out because you blocked the press and didn't want people to see the Biden cages the secure facilities in which they are locked down in Donna 
that uh, those facilities, how many children have been in them? Senator, there are three types of facilities. There's the, the Donna tent cages, there, the, the Donna tent city. Let's take the Donna facility. How many children have been there? That is a soft sided facility. It is not. A OK, you're, are you going to answer the question? How many children have been in that facility? I, I will have to circle back with you with a precise number. Oh, by the way, here's a photograph of the Biden cages that um, as a senator um, that is precisely why I articulated Children beginning. sleeping on floors crashed in upon each other. When I took this photograph, the COVID rate, rate of COVID positivity was over 10 percent. May I may I speak, Senator? You can answer the question. How many kids have been in these that, conditions? That is precisely why I stated in March of this year that a Border Patrol station is no place for a child, number one. OK, but and number two, all right, that uh, is precisely. Secretary Mayorkas, you're not answering my questions. No, and he won't because it will expose the hypocrisy. The way Biden and Pasaki talk about how the prior administration treated children and separated them. What uh, Cruz is doing here, obviously, is he's using their vernacular against them. And moreover, he's trying to expose the fact that even compared to the Trump administration, this administration, in terms of the number of children who've been separated and the number of children who've been housed and whatever you want to call them, is an enormous number, far greater than the Trump administration ever even contemplated because of our open borders policies. Cut to go. In the past year, has Joe Biden been down to see firsthand the Biden cages? Senator, I will again... Respect. Has Joe Biden been down to see this facility? The, yes or no? The president... Has not been down to the Okay, border. no. Has Kamala Harris been down to see the Biden cages, this facility? Um, yes or no? Uh, the vice president was at the border. Has she been down to see this facility? I know she went to El Paso. Has she seen the Biden cages? They are not cages. And um, what are these walls? Senator. The ha has, has Kamala Harris seen them? Yes or no? Senator, the the. It's a simple question. Yes I, or no? I did, we don't need a paragraph. Yes or no? Has Kamala Harris been down to see these detention facilities? She has not been down. Okay. Has any Democratic senator on this committee been down to see the Biden cages? I will once again disagree with your use of terminology. These facilities, has any Democratic member of this committee given a damn enough to see the children being locked up by Joe Biden and Kamala Harris because of your failed immigration policies? Uh, Senator, I cannot speak to um, the members of this committee. And you, you don't know if any Democrats have been down there? To, to oh, I, I believe d Democrats have been down. To see this facility, yes or no? On a facility, whether they are members of this committee, I do not know. Isn't it amazing? Simple question, how many Democrats have been at this facility? And the answer, obviously, on the committee, none. And yet they have oversight responsibility, ladies and gentlemen. I wonder how many in the media have been down there. How many of the media platforms out there have been down there? The fact that this guy can't tell the truth, the fact that this guy can't be straightforward, why can't they just say, we believe in open borders? We've got all kinds of kids in these facilities. Lots and lots and lots and lots of them. Because they're liars. They're destroying the border. They're destroying the border towns. They're destroying local school systems and, and hospitals and law enforcement, they're overwhelmed. You can't just have millions of people coming into this country over a period of time. And of course, they're flying them now into Florida. They're flying them all over the country without telling people. If this is such a great thing, why not tell us all about it? But there was more. And I want you to hear it. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Over 2,000 of you, my listeners, made the switch from overpriced wireless carriers to Pure Talk over the past few months. We want the rest of you to join us and to see what we're talking about. If you're with AT&T and Verizon or T-Mobile, your family could save over $800 a year just by switching to Pure Talk. You get great coverage, you can keep your phone and your number, and you'll save a fortune. 
Pure Talk is the top-rated wireless company by Consumer Affairs with the absolute best consumer service team based right here in America. Does that sound good? Well, it gets better. Right now, get unlimited talk, text, and six gigs of data, just $30 a month. And if you go over on data, they don't charge you for it. They don't care. Go to puretalkusa.com and enter promo code Levin Podcast. Again, puretalkusa.com, promo code Levin, L E V I N Podcast. And when you do, you'll save 50% off your first month. That's puretalkusa.com, promo code Levin Podcast. Pure Talk USA, simply smarter wireless. We have a special guest before we get back to immigration. We have a man who believes in the rule of law and justice. And uh, his name is David Schoen. He's a very good man. He's also chairman of of ZOA. And I've gotten to know him a little bit, and I admire him greatly. He's a constitutionalist. You may recall he was one of the lead lawyers representing President Trump uh, during the first impeachment attack. And now he's representing Steve Bannon as this never-ending saga goes on. David Schoen, how are you, sir? Fine, thank you. What an honor to be on your show. Well, it's a great honor. What, what is going on here? They seem to be throwing a very, very broad net all around the former White House, all around the place, just hoping they can find some embarrassing email or text and so forth. And President Trump saying, wait a minute. Executive privilege extends beyond my being president. I mean, the same principles apply, uh, and you will weaken the executive branch if a Democrat House with a Democrat committee operating on behalf of the Speaker and a Democrat president refuses to assert executive privilege because they're sort of working together to go after a former president. First of all, isn't this kind of Stalinist, Stalinist-like? And secondly, what are the constitutional issues? Well, yeah, I mean, you've got it all in a nutshell on what you just said. Let me be clear from the beginning, since we've got a pending case here. I don't generally address pending cases, but I am right. addressing this case because I think I have an obligation to respond. Because the Attorney General Garland saw fit to issue a press release on Friday after Mr. Bannon was indicted. And in it, he said that the charges against Mr. Bannon reflect the Department of Justice's steadfast commitment to pursuing equal justice under the law. I can't think of much that's further from the truth than that. Um, this is in no way uh, the pursuit of equal justice under the law. To, to put it in perspective, by the way, four people since 2008 have been referred for criminal contempt. And that's what Mr. Bannon is charged with, criminal contempt to the Justice Department. Not one of them was ever charged with criminal contempt. Lois Lerner, Eric Holder, Harriet Myers, Josh Bolton, all across the board politically. This what we're seeing today from the Biden administration, from this Congress, is the politicization of the criminal process for vindictive reasons. Um, What they did in those other cases, and three of the four, is they had a dispute over whether the documents should be turned over, and so they initiated a civil enforcement action to get a judge to decide whether they should be turned over. That's all Mr. Bannon asked for here. Former President Trump invoked executive privilege. Mr. Bannon's lawyer received a letter directing him not to appear and not to turn over any documents because privilege has been invoked. His lawyer advised him to honor that. Mr. Ben wanted to honor that for the former president because it clearly does apply. A former president, we know from the case of Nixon versus General Services Administration, a former president can invoke privilege. And it's a very important privilege. In the Mazars case, the court said this is a privilege of the highest sanctity, uh, executive privilege. Why? Because the president of the United States has to be able to speak freely to advisors, even if they're no longer on the staff. We often call, the president often calls on former advisors because they're a wealth of knowledge. They knew something then, they know something now, and they're kept in the loop. So if privilege was invoked. Mr. Bannon's lawyer directed him not to appear, not to produce the documents. He followed those directions, and they said to the committee, if the, once the privilege issue is resolved with President Trump or a court orders him to provide the documents to appear, he will comply fully. There's no... All right, all right, stop right there. This is very, very important. So basically, what you're saying is you want to let the process play out with the courts, with the challenges, because what they're demanding is well beyond I can ever think of a Congress demanding from a former president and his and his allies or staff or advisors or whatever. I don't ever remember a case like this. 
uh, uh, this right. sort of thing. Am I right about that? And think about th- you're right about that. And think about this some more. First of all, there are Office of Legal Counsel opinions directly on this that they are not to subpoena executive branch and even former executive branch people for this kind of thing. Secondly, what Mr. Bannon asked for was simply to have a representative of the person who invoked the privilege present, so that they can make a par- uh, item by item objection during the testimony if something came that was privileged. But think about this. Think about who is demanding these items and and the vindictive nature of this punishment. You have a committee here that's a complete sham. The American people deserve better. If you really want to investigate the facts of what happened on January 6th, then you don't have it headed up by Chairman Benny Thompson. Chairman mm-hmm. Benny Thompson sued President Trump, and in that lawsuit, he represented to the court that the entire incident was instigated by President Trump himself, that President Trump supported white supremacists, that he, Thompson's life, was put in grave danger. So, and this is the responsibility of the president. How on earth can the American people stand to have someone like that leading an investigation? That's no investigation. What happens when he comes up with the facts that dispute that? Then you've got Adam Schiff on there. Uh, his history is well known, I think, to your listeners. Uh, Jamie Raskin. Jamie Raskin was the lead prosecutor of President Trump's impeachment, in which he specifically alleged that the president uh, was responsible for January 6th. This is a sham. And these are the people demanding the documents. Uh, Thompson has his own interest, saying that he was personally put in danger. And now uh, criminal charges brought against Mr. Bannon, changing his life. And they didn't have, as you point out, this is important. All right, first of all, we're going to have a break. Can you stay over the break for a little bit with me? Yes, sir. Sure. But as you point out, this is, this is key. He said, I'll follow the law once we understand exactly what the law is. Once we hear from the court, the court has to adjudicate these things. The president of the United States, the former president, has a case in front of a real court. Uh, we'll see how this goes. I mean, even though there's precedent and there's, there's good precedent and a lot of precedent, what they've done now to Bannon and Trump is unprecedented, the extent of it. So I want to I circle back with you when we come back, Counselor. We'll be right back. Levin, making conservatism great again. Dial in now, 877-381-3811. David Schoen is a great lawyer. He was one of the lead counsels, not the lead counsel, in the first Trump impeachment attack, and now he represents Steve Bannon. And he has conferred information to me and to you I was utterly unaware of. Um... That basically, Bannon had said, no, I mean, the President of the United States, he's in charge of these documents. He has asserted privilege, that is Donald Trump, and uh, we'll wait till this is adjudicated, and when a court decides if I'm ordered to do something, I'll do it. So he's not a criminal. He's not a criminal. And you know, uh, David Schoen, Congress isn't always right. That's why you go to court to get these things adjudicated. And it is very, very important that you're out there now, because nobody's hearing this. Nobody is hearing this. This is absurd, isn't it? You have these legal analysts. They're writing on the Hill. Some of them are even former friends of mine that Bannon and, and, and Trump's aides and former friends, and they have, no, uh, they have nothing to stand on. Go get them. Well, apparently they do, don't they? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. And, and, and you know, one of the saddest circumstances here is that the biggest loser is the American people. If anybody in America is interested in finding out what happened on January 6th, all of those facts, they certainly will not find it out through this committee, and this committee deserves zero credibility. When you have people leading it who have already publicly announced their prejudgment and their personal interest in it. By the way, I left out Congresswoman Liz Cheney. Oh, does that now, Congresswoman Cheney, she announced that the root causes of the events on January 6th were directly and unequivocally attributable to former President Trump. Mm-hmm. You can't investigate when you've already made up your mind. It's a scam. Um, I, I, want, I want the listeners to consider this, by the way. Every listener out there. Mr. Bannon is a lay person. Mr. Bannon was put in this position, not of his choosing. So a biased uh, committee of Congress that's prejudged the in, I- issue issued subpoenas. This was a setup. They issued subpoenas uh, demanding production of things. They knew the president would invoke privilege for it. The privilege was invoked. Now, Mr. Bannon is a private citizen now, a lay person. He doesn't know this process. His lawyer, a very experienced, seasoned lawyer, told him, we got this letter and privilege was invoked. I direct you not to turn it over. Privilege would be waived if you did. 
You have no right to produce the documents or to appear. And because he followed his lawyer's advice and honored the privilege invoked by the former president, he now faces a prison sentence. He's charged with a crime. So that could happen to any American out there, any lay citizen, who in good faith listened to their lawyer and followed the process. By the way, these kinds of disputes come up in discovery in every civil case. Lawyers demand something in discovery. The other side said, I believe this is privileged, or I'm not turning it over for this reason. And you go to a neutral arbiter, a judge, who decides. Uh, and in that case, uh, generally, most litigants are even as biased as this uh, politicized committee is. Yeah, they're not investigating anything. They're trying to... Uh to hang these people out to dry. Now, uh, what, what is their rush, David Schoen? Why, why are they in such a hurry? Why can't they wait for the courts to make a decision? Exactly a great question. And what we read now is they're issuing more and more subpoenas. They're subpoenaing the uh, record, telephone records of other members of Congress. You know that uh, Pelosi, re- uh, what her name is, Speaker Pelosi, uh, refused to seat uh, Congressman Banks, Congressman Jordan on this, because they had a different view of how to investigate. They wanted a real investigation. Now some of them are finding their records subpoenaed, accusations are being made. This is all, I'm afraid, to take the um, attention away from some of the failings that are going on in the country and the administration right now. And everything is about get Trump, get Trump, get Trump. Whatever Trump initiated has to be reversed. And it's, a, it's a creating a tremendous polarization in the country and, again, making people cynical about government. No American citizen, reasonable person, would accept an investigation by a group of prejudging, uh, biased people, just like the Mueller Commission could not be accepted uh, if they'd come up with some other kind of conclusion. When you have someone like Andrew Weissman, uh, an avowed hater of all things Trump, and someone willing to you know, go to all ends. And I'm sitting here thinking to myself, by the way, these other congressmen, how, how can one, how can a committee subpoena other, con- they have a speech and debate clause defense, don't they? Sure. They I mean, do, I mean, and, and, and it's, a, yeah. I mean, we've reached a point where members of Congress are subpoenaing other members of Congress. How sick is this? And members of Congress, a guy like Schiff or, who, or Nadler, who in the past have decried this kind of, oh, we mustn't do that, and we can't, we have, uh, can't politicize this process even, and so on. But when it comes to getting Donald Trump, their fear of him running again or trying to bury him, there absolutely is no uh, end too far. It's, uh, it's repulsive, frankly. It's, it's really offensive to the American people, I think. I wonder if uh, the members of this committee and Nancy Pelosi had to reveal their emails and their texts and their personal communications. I think we'd find a treasure trove of stuff, wouldn't we? I mean, I think, frankly, that in the context of our criminal case now that they've forced on us, we're going to have to subpoena members of Congress. I mean, first of all, if there is a requirement that subpoena seek pertinent information, what did Congressman Thompson have in mind here exactly? And what motivated them in this case to selectively prosecute? Why in this case? Are they pushing it for criminal contempt? As you say, what was their hurry? Why not have a civil enforcement action? Take it before a judge. Bannon said, oh, I'll comply fully with whatever any judge uh, orders in this case. Why not do that? And by the way, by going criminal, you don't get the information. The penalty here is Mr. Bannon, God forbid, would go to prison and pay a fine. You don't get the information with civil contempt, at least. You know, they say you have the keys to jail in your pocket. Then you can coerce information out, possibly. Um, but you get a judge to order it. That's the process. That's the process the American people uh, would be interested in. And you know, David, Sean, I read the decision by the Obama-appointed federal district judge uh, in the Trump case. And yeah. among other things, she says that, that Joe Biden, the current president, is the best position to determine how to protect the executive branch. I thought to myself, now this is ridiculous. First of all, yeah. Donald Trump has an independent right to assert it. That's number one. Number two, he's at the same party as Pelosi. And he could run again for president, God forbid. So he'd want to do as much damage to Donald Trump as he possibly can. I mean, I mean, what, look at this. You have, you have a triumvirate of Democrats basically making these decisions, which kind of undermines our constitutional system. 100% right. And, of course, the idea of executive privilege uh, derives, most constitutional scholars would say, from the concept of separation of powers, mm. among other things. Um, but, you, you know, uh, in this case, unprecedented. Remember that President Biden publicly called for Bannon to be prosecuted. They must be held accountable. Anyone who doesn't turn over the documents this committee, uh, this committee demands. That's a complete, a completely inappropriate. He admitted it was inappropriate. It's pressure on the Justice Department, and sure enough, they indicted. 
And we see this attorney general as highly, extremely political, whether it's parents protesting at a school board meeting, whether it is uh, state legislatures passing election laws that are not as he claims they are, whether it's Texas on an abortion law. He gets into these cases, really, where the federal government and the Department of Justice have no role, tries to find some civil rights angle into it, and gets involved in these cases. So he's pounding on parents in Loudoun County and the rest of the country. I mean, this guy is, has to be the most political attorney general in modern times, don't you think? Uh, yeah, Eric Holder, uh, give him a little run well, for that's money, a good one. I would say. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, but, but, but give Merrick Garland some time. He's, he's only been there, you know, he's only been there. Uh, <laughs> all right, so what judge. happens this now? He's a federal judge. Yes. Well, what happens now is, uh, you know, we have a status conference on Thursday, and the court will set a schedule and uh, for trial. But uh, we're going to seek a great deal of discovery in this case. I think we're entitled to it. We're going to have to challenge every element here and uh, make them prove their case. We have to know what happened here. How did this happen with this committee? And why is it happening now? Why is there a selective prosecution? Um, a lot of issues have to be addressed. So will you be and, asking the way, the for their... Position is, yeah, yes. go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. And the government's, the government's position is advice of counsel is no defense. There was a case in 1961 in the District of Columbia that said that. However, now we've had a series of cases since then that talk about what willful really means. The idea that a lawyer directing the client, a layperson, in a uh, complicated legal proceeding, how to act, and if the person acts on that advice, that he could still be acting willfully and committing a crime is absolutely anathema to any sense of fairness. Plus, as you said, or at least intimated before, you can't have people who served a former president or in the private sector now undermining a legitimate constitutional claim of executive privilege before it's been adjudicated. Yep. And that that, that seems as to me said, to be what's key. The hurry? What's that? What's the hurry? The court in Mesa said the sanctity yes. of this kind of privilege is tremendous. So do it properly. Uh, you know, January 6th happened. Uh, no, nobody's going away. You know, do it properly. But the specter of bringing an in and charging with a crime and all that, it's, it's outrageous. May I ask you? now the same with, you know, Mark Meadows and the others. Oh, I mean, you've got a whole uh, lot, list of people now. They've subpoenaed so many people. So my question is, do, do you know who the judge is? I guess you do. Who is the judge? Yes. This is a judge named uh, Judge Nichols in this mm-hmm. case. Um, all right. We expect to be a very fair judge. All right. Well, to the extent you can... I hope you'll uh, use our program and me to get, get information out that the rest of the media simply is not going to report. You're going to be inundated now, just to warn you. So choose carefully, Dave. Of course. Well, it's an honor to do your show, I'll tell you that. Uh, well, it's the most popular show around. So. Well, it's an honor that you're doing what you're doing. You're, you're a hell of a lawyer. And uh, I wish you all Thank the you best, and I wish uh, Mr. Bannon all the best, too. God bless you, my friend. Thank you. You too. God bless all you. All right. Take Thank care. You very much. Well, they're in for a fight. Right, Mr. B? You can see that. See, folks, it's not so black and white as Amy McCarthy incoherently laid out at the Hill, I thought. And this is not a personal attack. I just thought the piece was long, rambling, and way off. There's a difference between commenting on the Rittenhouse case, as many former federal prosecutors, state prosecutors, defense counsel have. And good for them. They know a hell of a lot more than I do when it comes to those matters. But when it comes to constitutional matters, you're talking about a guy like Sean or me. We have spent decades studying this stuff. I mean, the case law, the history, it's not something you can just shoot from the hip or think you're, you're, you know, and I'm talking about all these commentators, all of them. It's not something you can just, you can just get in there and wing. There are a number of cases that are relevant to this. And the civil enforcement action is the way they're supposed to go. But we have a corrupt attorney general, a corrupt Department of Justice, And you're seeing this a lot now with prosecutors, the Rittenhouse case, as we talked about. You're seeing a lot of it. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Over 2,000 of you, my listeners, made the switch from overpriced wireless carriers to Pure Talk over the past few months. We want the rest of you to join us and to see what we're talking about. If you're with AT&T and Verizon or T-Mobile, your family could save over $800 a year just by switching to Pure Talk. You get great coverage, you can keep your phone and your number, and you'll save a fortune. 
Pure Talk is the top rated wireless company by Consumer Affairs with the absolute best consumer service team based right here in America. Does that sound good? Well, it gets better. Right now, get unlimited talk, text, and six gigs of data, just $30 a month. And if you go over on data, they don't charge you for it. They don't care. Go to puretalkusa.com and enter promo code Levin Podcast. Again, puretalkusa.com, promo code Levin, L E V I N Podcast. And when you do, you'll save 50% off your first month. That's puretalkusa.com, promo code Levin Podcast. Pure Talk USA, simply smarter wireless. So what did you learn here? You learned something that you haven't heard in a single news broadcast on any news platform in the country, period. And I'm not a journalist, although neither are they. What did you learn? You learned that Steve Bannon followed the advice of his prior counsel not to submit to the demands of the committee because the former president of the United States had exerted executive privilege and his lawyer had asked that other people who receive subpoenas and so forth not comply because the matter is before a federal court to make a determination on the president, that is President Trump's assertion of executive privilege. And there's plenty of precedent that former presidents have to some degree uh, the authority to do exactly that. So you don't leave it up to a biased, radical committee with Adam Schiff and the, this chairman, Benny Thompson, and and Liz Cheney and Adam Kingsinger, in other words, hacks that hate Trump and are just trying to destroy him and everybody around him, they don't get to make the final determination. And you're not supposed to try and send people to prison who resist a committee like this, but are, but are compliant with any court process that takes place and are compliant with any court decision that takes place. That's why Bannon, out of only five people, five people who've been held in contempt by Congress, has been charged with a crime. Only Bannon. And so, this is again a disastrous miscarriage of justice. You have these frauds, these legal analysts, all over the place, who don't know they're legal analysts from a hole in the ground, who are not telling you the truth, that this matter should be resolved, at least in part, with a civil enforcement action, as well as the constitutional challenge. What's the hurry? And so the Department of Justice immediately pulls the trigger. Immediately pulls the trigger. And and the Attorney General of the United States, who is corrupt in my view, he's a radical leftist, dressed up as, uh, you know, some kind of a boring jurist. Just my opinion. Puts out a press statement that this is equal justice. You know, nobody's above the law. Well, apparently, he's a liar. It has nothing to do with equal justice. It has nothing to do with applying the law equitably, quote-unquote. His role is to follow the Constitution and the rule of law. Why would you charge somebody with a crime when the adjudicative process hasn't even been completed? It's barely even started. Well, look what's going on all over the country. Look at Kyle Rittenhouse and how the media report this. Look at James O'Keefe and what's happened to him. And you can go on and on down the list. Meanwhile, look at the other side. Look at Hunter Biden. Look at the Bidens, period. And you go on and on and on. When we return, we will continue with Mr. Mayorkas, who goes up in front of this committee and acts like he's Helen Keller. He sees nothing, he hears nothing, and he's mute. And of course, he's setting the policy. And look how they live and connive. We're enforcing the border. No, you're not. Even foreign governments are telling us we're not enforcing our border. What a disastrous, disastrous administration. What a diabolical administration. What a disastrous and diabolical Democrat hold on the House and the Senate. It's just unbelievable. I'll be right back. 
Ladies and gentlemen, this final hour of the podcast is sponsored exclusively by AMAC, the Association of Mature American Citizens. Now over 2 million conservative members strong, AMAC believes in and stands up for the values that we care about, faith, family, and freedom. Thank you for listening, and please support AMAC. And you can become a member at amac.us slash join. He's here. He's here. Now, broadcasting from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. Hello, America. Mark Levin here. Hour three. It's as powerful as hour one. Stay with us. Get a little bit of uh, news-breaking information from David Schoen, who's a fantastic litigator and constitutional lawyer, real constitutional lawyer, who uh, represented President Trump in the first impeachment attack and now represents Steve Bannon. And Steve Bannon could not do better than David Schoen. You've heard him lay out the points here that you never heard anywhere else. And you haven't read anywhere else. That's the difference between a real expert, experienced expert, who's litigated in the field of constitutional law, and others who don't, who shoot from the hip. If you watch CNN and MSNBC, you'll have no idea what the hell is going on. All you'll know is, Bannon has defied a House committee. Bannon has defied a House committee. He should go to prison. Who is he to defy a House committee? Whenever you hear anything on MSLSD or the Constipated News Network, any of these platforms on the left you know they're liars you know they're corrupt if russia collusion didn't teach anything it taught you that right and they don't correct themselves they're not introspective they're not circumspective oh the washington post will throw out a thing here or there they'll get their guy wemple the dimple you know he'll he'll say a little late boys you know trump is is not in the white house any longer well maybe we shouldn't have written this and should no maybe you should have done the right job in the first place as I said yesterday. All right. I didn't forget where we were. Let's swing back. Mayorkas. So Ted Cruz uh, chews him up and spits him out. Now it's Mike Lee's turn. You know what a fan I am of Mike Lee. Cut three. Go. Like Yuri Medina Uloa, who's a 24-year-old Honduran man who was recently apprehended crossing the U.S.-Mexico border, where he fraudulently claimed to be a 17-year-old. He then ended up in Jacksonville, Florida, where a family took him in. Days later, he stabbed the father of that family to death. He was a 24-year-old, not a 17-year-old, as he claimed. There are people like him crossing, and with the assistance, with the approval, with the facilitation, in some cases, of your department, these things are happening. That is is inaccurate. I am aware uh, of the case. That individual is being prosecuted. There is an immigration enforcement detainer on that individual. Did your department or did it not allow him in? Um, uh, Senator, I'd like to not comment on the details because... That's not exactly a detail. Did you let him in the country or not? And the answer is yes. Everybody knows that he wants to hear it out of your mouth. But listen to my orca. If I may, Senator, there is a criminal case against that individual pending. Whether or not that individual committed fraud and deceived our personnel is a question that may be relevant to the ongoing criminal prosecution. Uh, And so it would be inappropriate for me to comment on a pending criminal matter at this time. What's inappropriate is for your administration to continue leaving these borders open. Thank you, Senator. While pushing to turn on the poll factors. That's wrong. And it's immoral. And it's harming the security of the American people. That's exactly right. Nobody's asking for details about their investigation. As Mike Lee is pointing out, and as he's underscoring, this man is a killer. And but for this administration letting him in, this latest victim wouldn't have been killed. But look how they just walk through. Oh, well, you know, okay. Not going to comment on, you know. Maybe they should subpoena his text records and his emails and all the rest of it. Hmm? Lindsey Graham hammered away. Cut four, go. Uh, Do you believe uh, that the Biden immigration policies are successful? 
Uh, Senator, I, uh, I think rebuilding a broken immigration system and rebuilding a dismantled one takes time, and we're on the road to success. So you think we're on the right track as a nation? I do. Okay. How would you grade yourself? Uh, Senator, um, I'm a tough grader on myself, and I give myself um, an A for effort, investment, okay. in mission, and support of our workforce. Okay. Do you think you're doing a better job than the Trump administration? Uh, uh, Senator, I believe in the policies that we are putting forward, and I condemn a number of the policies that were promulgated in the prior administration. So you think we have more control over the border now than we did under Trump? Uh, Senator, we're very focused on the uh, number That's of not the question. You'd be focused. Do you think we have more control over the border now than we did under the last administration? I think we have more control that is consistent with our values. As- mm-hmm. And those values are what exactly? What are those values exactly? Apparently not much. All right, let's go to cut five. Of the 1.7 million, how many people are still here? I would estimate approximately 375,000 are still here. Yes. Okay. That is my best estimate. Do you believe, right, do you believe that if you have an immigration hearing and there's a final order of deportation, that person should be removed. I do. Okay. Why is one million people still here after they get a final order of deportation? Um, uh, Senator uh, Graham, as I uh, responded to... Is the system working? Oh, the the immigration system is broken, has been broken. Well, let me just say this. It's really broken if a million people have been ordered to leave and they haven't left. Do you believe that the Remain in Mexico policy instituted by the Trump administration is cruel? Uh, As it was implemented, I do. Do you support permanently doing away with the Remain in Mexico policy? I do. Do you think that will increase illegal immigration if we do? Um, I do not because of the other efforts that we have underway. And that is amazing to me. This guy uh, mumbling around. It's obvious, whether he thinks so or not, that it is not a disincentive. It's quite the contrary. Now, remain in Mexico. How is that inhumane? You remain in Mexico till we figure out who you are and we adjudicate your situation. Isn't that in America's best interest? Isn't that in the best interest of the American citizen? Of course it is. And that was worked out by Donald Trump with the president of Mexico. That is a big deal. That is a major diplomatic accomplishment. And look how they just wave it off. They just broom it. Cut six. Your this, is, this is uh, Senator John Kennedy. <clears throat> Excuse me. Who, Mr. Perdue doesn't want to come on my show. I don't know why. He's all over the place. He's second to Lindsay all over the place. Go ahead. Your administration has released thousands of people into our country who are COVID positive, have you not? Uh, uh, Senator, as I mentioned earlier, it is our policy to test and, as necessary, isolate and quarantine. I know, but you've individuals. still released thousands who are positive, haven't you? Uh, there have been individuals who have been released. Um, um, and by the way, those individuals, uh, just to be clear, because there's a misperception, those individuals who are not immediately expelled or removed under expedited processes are placed into immigration enforcement proceedings. Right, right. They are but I'm talking about COVID. Now, folks, so you understand what that means. They're not placed into anything. They're roaming the country. They're given a date to show up. They're given some papers. And over 90% of them never show up. Why? Because the administration has announced that most people are not going to be deported. So this is, this is a semantical game. You're wondering why the borders are open. You're wondering why we're overwhelmed. You're wondering why people are coming in here with this, this virus. This is why. Now, he says some individuals have been who have been. It's not some individuals. It's thousands of individuals. Thousands. He doesn't even know how many individuals have come into this country. So how would he know how many individuals come into this country with the virus? Which is, I think, Senator John Kennedy's point. You don't know. And by the way, you don't give a damn. One more. Senator Tom Tillis. Cut seven, go. 
So I, I've got to get to one question, though. It has to do with vaccinations. I've read several reports about a relatively low receptivity rate uh, for the vaccine. Now, we've got a president who's implementing a national mandate for vaccines for any employers, over 100 employees and all federal employees. Why shouldn't we mandate that somebody who comes across the border illegally shouldn't be vaccinated or that's a reason for expulsion? Under well, Title 42 or any other law? Uh, um, Senator, um, uh, the analysis for um, uh, migrants encountered at the border is quite different uh, than for uh, the federal workforce that leads by example. We are, in fact, removing uh, those individuals. We're expelling uh, them very rapidly. I mean, this, this is amazing to me. We know that different federal laws apply to immigrants as opposed to the federal workforce which presumably consists mostly of American citizens. One has nothing to do with the other. That's not his question. His question is, if you're going to impose on the American people unconstitutionally and illegally through OSHA vaccine mandates mandated by the federal government for the first time in American history, why won't you share your science and medicine and such genius and do that to people who come in here illegally? If it's an emergency for American citizens, why is it an emergency for people who come into this country? And he didn't answer it. And they're never going to answer it. Instead, they want to talk about a pathway to citizenship. They don't need a pathway to citizenship. They have a pathway right into the United States. And one day, maybe it'll be next year, five years, 10, 20 years from now, we're going to have the amnesty argument. Let's do amnesty. And when the Democrats have 51 senators... And they have the House by two or three additional votes. And they have a Democrat president. They'll push their amnesty. They'll kill the filibuster, push their amnesty, then it's over. We've got to do something more critical than just win elections. That's very, very important. Don't get me wrong. But we can't, we can't live as a republic that's always one election away from not being a republic. Something I've been doing a lot of thinking about. It's something we're going to talk about in the weeks and months ahead. It's something to think about with Convention of States. In other words, we're not going to win all these elections all the time, every time. And the Democrats have made it abundantly clear now that if they have the chance, they're going to permanently kill this society. So the game is different than it ever was before. That's why I wrote the book American Marxism. It's different. The Democrat Party is a party of ideologues. That's why Manchin and Cinema stand out like a sore thumb. Look at that. Manchin's blocking our agenda. And what is that agenda? Well, you'll have to pass the bill to read it. Nationalizing this, redistributing that, taking your wealth on this. You can't pass this on to your kids. We want to educate your kids from kindergarten on. We want to teach them stuff, you know, like critical race theory and transgenderism and all the kind of stuff that they need to know. And, of course, their hate for capitalism, climate change. Of course, we you don't. What are you a denier? And uh, and and the Green New Deal. Oh, it sounds so cool. It's green and it's new and it's a deal. I'll be right back. Mark Levin. AMAC, the Association of Mature American Citizens, is one of the fastest growing organizations in America. Now over 2 million conservative members strong, and I'm one of them. AMAC believes in and stands up for the values that we constitutional conservatives care about. More than talk, AMAC fights. A full-time presence in Washington, AMAC pushes back against reckless spending, disasters like Medicare for All, and the expanding reach of the federal government. And beyond advocacy, joining AMAC gives you access to a wealth of benefits and discounts, including special member-only rates on car insurance, travel discounts, cell phone plans, and a hell of a lot more. And if that's not enough, you'll get AMAC's bi-monthly magazine full of insightful articles on issues that matter to most of us, we conservatives. As I said, I'm an AMAC member, and you should be too. Join today at amac.us. That's A-M-A-C dot U-S. Stop supporting the liberal agenda that the other 50-plus organization has been pushing for. Join AMAC instead. A-M-A-C dot U-S.
Gail in Malvern, I believe it is, Pennsylvania. I know where that is. On, uh, what was it, XM? How are you, Gail? On the Levina. Very well. How are you? Yes. I'm great, um, thank you. Actually, uh, tu- tune in app. Oh. Tune I don't in even know what that is. There's so but, many uh, things out there. Yes. And thank you so much for every night, for so many years, constantly providing excellent information and excellent perspective and always with energy and you know vitality oh, so thank, thank you. you thank you you're welcome you're welcome all right what else i'm calling because well i'm calling because even though you're probably accurate that it doesn't matter why the corporate media is you know the democrat media it probably doesn't matter it is what it is it just occurs to me that uh the reason it seems like they are is because they want to be the communist cronies of a sort of central committee and they will say and do anything to divide people and do the democrats bidding because we all know what they've become And even in promoting regulations and global warming and carbon taxes, they want to put out their small business competition. Mm -hmm. Small business can't afford carbon taxes, so why would they be promoting, you know, taxes for themselves? It's because they want to put out small business competition and be more monopolistic as part of the uh, corporate oligarchy there, you know. And they clearly hate the country. They clearly hate the country. Yes. Yes, I agree All right, with that. Yeah. And, uh, yes, thank you. All right, you take care of yourself. Nancy, same neighborhood, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the great WPHT. How are you? Yes, good evening, Mark. God yes, bless ma'am. you. You too. I'm shouting by radio. Go, Mark. Oh, thank Listen, you. Mark, I hope. I hope that the public sees that the January 6th hearings are nothing more than a kangaroo court. And everyone who was subpoenaed... By the way, that's a good way to put it. It is a kangaroo court. Absolutely. And everyone subpoenaed to answer questions should say either, I do not recall, or what difference does it make now? Just like (laughs) Hillary always said. Oh, yes. But, you know, there's two sets of rules, one for them and one for us. The way it goes. I mean, the the idea that that Bannon is criminally charged for this is so disgusting. It's so outrageous. Maybe 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 folks should be destroying their 30,000 emails, too, like Hillary did. Mm Mm-hmm. That's true. We have a precedent, don't we? Yes, yes. And, it, and of course Hillary was behind the whole Russia collusion issue, and there she is, sitting there in her home in Westchester, busy uh, eating uh, chocolate kisses. That's All right, my friend. Thank you. You take care. It is pretty damn outrageous what's going on, and Hillary gets away with this all the time. Why? Why should she? Well, she shouldn't. All right, Mr. Producer, let me see what I'm doing here. Uh, call screen's not working. We have another caller, JD, San Diego, XM Satellite. Go right ahead, please. Good evening, Doctor. How are you doing today? I'm all right. How are you, sir? I'm doing quite well. Uh, let me start off by saying I'm a Christian man who supports the nation of Israel. I'm also a 24 year veteran of the United States Navy. God bless you. Uh, I, I have so many times fought for rights that at times we did not even have, but I still fight for them today. Mm. And the reason being is because I wanted to promote the idea of being in America, you can succeed if you are willing to work hard. And unfortunately, the Democrats and the liberal establishment are trying to kill everything that is good about America. Are you African American? First of all, as a matter of fact, sir, I am. Because you said for some of our rights that we haven't had, and you're right. Can you hold on? The, the music's coming till after the bottom, sir? Yes, sir. All right, hold on. We're going to return to you, and we'll be right back.
AMAC, the Association of Mature American Citizens, is one of the fastest growing organizations in America. Now over 2 million conservative members strong, and I'm one of them. AMAC believes in and stands up for the values that we constitutional conservatives care about. More than talk, AMAC fights. A full-time presence in Washington, AMAC pushes back against reckless spending, disasters like Medicare for All, and the expanding reach of the federal government. And beyond advocacy, joining AMAC gives you access to a wealth of benefits and discounts, including special member-only rates on car insurance, travel discounts, cell phone plans, and a hell of a lot more. And if that's not enough, you'll get AMAC's bi-monthly magazine full of insightful articles on issues that matter to most of us, we conservatives. As I said, I'm an AMAC member, and you should be too. Join today at amac.us. That's A-M-A-C dot U-S. Stop supporting the liberal agenda that the other 50-plus organization has been pushing for. Join AMAC instead. A-M-A-C dot U-S. The one-man antidote for liberal media bias, Mark Levin. Call him now at 877-381-3811. FBI tracks threats against teachers, school board members. Really? That's interesting. Federal Bureau of Investigation has set up a process to track threats against school board members and teachers moving to implement a Justice Department directive that some law enforcement officials and Republican lawmakers say could improperly target parents protesting local education policies. Look at this. The FBI, this is why when the National School Board Association wrote that memo, not only did I know that the government was behind it, ladies and gentlemen, let's take this one step further. Not only did the White House and the Department of Justice and the Department of Education coordinate with the National School Board Association. I suspect they called in the National School Board Association and took the lead on this. Because since then, the National School Board Association has disowned the letter. Up to a score of their affiliates in the states have resigned from the National School Board Association. But who's plugging ahead? For political purposes. Once again, we had the Obama-Biden administration using the FBI for political purposes. Now we have the Biden-Harris administration. And there's Christopher Wray sitting there like that dummy that he is, with that stupid look on his face. The heads of the FBI's criminal and counterterrorism divisions instructed agents in an October 20 memo to flag all assessments and investigations into potentially criminal threats, harassment, and intimidation of educators with a threat tag, which the officials said would allow them to evaluate the scope of the problem. So they're going to put a threat tag on parents. The internal email, this was a whistleblower who gave this to Congress and this to, to some of the media. The internal email asked FBI agents to consider the motivation behind any criminal activity whether it potentially violates federal law. Agents should tag such threats as follows. Edu officials, E-D-U-O-F-F-I-C-I-A-L-S, edu officials, to better track them according to the memo, which was reviewed by the Wall Street Journal. The purpose of the threat tag, a threat tag, is to help scope this threat on a national level and provide an opportunity for a comprehensive analysis of the threat picture for effective engagement with law enforcement partners at all levels, says the email signed by Timothy Langan, L-A-N-G-A-N, the FBI's Assistant Director for Counterterrorism, and Calvin Shivers, the Assistant Director of the Bureau's Criminal Division, who retired this month. We have a Stasi here, ladies and gentlemen. An East German like Stasi. We're going to get hit with terrorism again, and I'm going to tell you why. And going to get hit hard. Number one, what Biden did in Afghanistan. Number two, the borders are wide open. We don't have the foggiest idea who the hell's coming in here. And number three, the FBI's so busy, so busy investigating and trying to punish law-abiding American citizens, including parents, 
so busy throwing all their resources, the most resources ever, on January 6th trespassers, that they are not in a position to protect this country. They're playing to the mob, they're playing to the media. Just like that prosecutor in Wisconsin. An FBI agent provided a copy of the internal email to several Republican lawmakers, citing concerns that it could open the door for the Bureau to collect information on parents voicing their opposition to local school policies during meetings. Exactly what we talked about. The FBI has never been in the business of investigating parents who speak out or policing speech at school board meetings. And we're not going to start now, the FBI said Tuesday in a statement. We are fully committed to preserving and protecting First Amendment rights, including freedom of speech. No, you're not. No, you're not. The new procedures were prompted by the October 4 memo from Garland, ordering the FBI to help local leaders address threats to school boards and so forth. We're well, well informed about that. The FBI, in its statement, described a threat tag as a tool to compile statistics and track information about a range of issues, including drug and human trafficking cases. The creation of a threat tag in no way changes the long-standing requirements for opening investigation, nor does it represent a shift in how the FBI prioritizes threats, the statement said. It sure as hell does. You're putting threat tags on parents now. And taxpayers. You just crossed the Rubicon. What are you talking about? It doesn't change anything. You become the Stasi. Mr. Garland said during a congressional hearing last month that while he didn't have a full accounting of such threats nationwide, complaints from school board officials and news reports show the problem is becoming more prevalent. Some Republicans say the DOJ is thrusting the FBI into what is usually considered a local issue. They say the tactics are in effect to silence parents who speak out at school board meetings about topics such as mass mandates and how race is addressed in schools. Unbelievable. The department is treating parents like domestic terrorists. They're involving their National Security Division in the Garland Initiative. The Attorney General denied it, but he can deny whatever he wants. It's quite obvious. At a House Intel subcommittee hearing earlier this month, several Republican lawmakers pressed Mr. Langan on the new directive. Does the FBI consider parents domestic terrorists? Representative Elsie, El- uh, excuse me, Elise Stefanik asked, to which Langan said no, adding as long as the individuals are not committing federal violations, force or violence in promotion of an ideology, they would not be. Unbelievable what's happening to this country. It is absolutely unbelievable. A senior Department of Homeland Security intelligence official, John Cohen, testified at the same hearing that while there were calls for violence directed at teachers and school board members on extremist platforms, and reports of sporadic incidents of violence, state and local law enforcement told the agency they weren't seeing widespread action. We're continuing to work with state and locals to maintain awareness of the environment. You don't need to maintain awareness of the environment. You didn't do it before you prompted the National School Board Association to write that phony letter that you then used, you used, to unconstitutionally and illegally expand your authority to American citizens. The October 20 email came from both the counterterrorism and criminal divisions. Suggesting the agency is grappling with how to handle the issues, said a former FBI counterterrorism official. Ah, bull crap. They're both involved. What are you talking about? There's no wall between the two units within the Department of Justice. It's a public safety issue if school board members feel like they're in potential of some kind of harm. Great. That's up to local law enforcement. Local law enforcement. Just like vaccines. State and local government. The FBI will have to tread very carefully. They can't open investigations into people showing up and protesting, said the former FBI senior official. Once someone crosses the line of direct threats of violence, whether in physical domain or virtually, that's a crime. But it's not a federal crime. It's not a federal crime. You parents out there, 
you're still in in grave threat. You're still under grave threat. You parents out there who are protesting, do not do not buckle. I'm not buckling behind this microphone. They want to appoint somebody to the FCC who has the intention of targeting people like me, trying to shut down conservative hosts, shut down Fox, OAN, Newsmax. You're seeing exactly what's going on here. This is why I called American Marxism, and I would ask my friends in radio, on Fox and elsewhere, stop please calling it socialism. Have the courage to call it what it is. Stop please calling it left-wing and progressivism. Please have the courage to call it what it is. In order to defeat this, we need to at least acknowledge what it is so we can analyze it and push back. But you're now seeing tyranny. It's right in front of your eyes. It's right in front of your eyes. Whether it's a committee of the House, like the phony January 6th committee, the Department of Justice is a disaster, totally out of control. When you see what they did to James O'Keefe at the FBI, when you see what they're trying to do to Steve Bannon, who's complying with the law, as a matter of fact, it's the Department of Justice and the committee that want to violate separation of powers. It's President Trump and these other people who are trying to get it adjudicated in the courts. And for that, the guy is indicted. What's taking place here is, in fact, unprecedented. It's unprecedented in this country. People want to talk about what a moron Biden is. Let me tell you something. I don't care if he's a moron. I don't care if he's negative 300 IQ points. The fact is he, his vice president, and this administration are tyrannical. That's the issue. Tyrannical. You can have an IQ of seven and be a tyrant. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. AMAC, the Association of Mature American Citizens, is one of the fastest growing organizations in America. Now over 2 million conservative members strong, and I'm one of them. AMAC believes in and stands up for the values that we constitutional conservatives care about. More than talk, AMAC fights. A full-time presence in Washington, AMAC pushes back against reckless spending, disasters like Medicare for All, and the expanding reach of the federal government. And beyond advocacy, joining AMAC gives you access to a wealth of benefits and discounts, including special member-only rates on car insurance, travel discounts, cell phone plans, and a hell of a lot more. And if that's not enough, you'll get AMAC's bi-monthly magazine full of insightful articles on issues that matter to most of us, we conservatives. As I said, I'm an AMAC member, and you should be too. Join today at amac.us. That's A-M-A-C dot U-S. Stop supporting the liberal agenda that the other 50-plus organization has been pushing for. Join AMAC instead. A-M-A-C dot U-S. question has been asked by my friend Vince, WMAL. Somebody told me there's a motion for mistrial still in front of the judge in Kenosha. Can he rule that there's a mistrial even after the jury gives its opinion? The answer is yes. The judge can do that at any point. The judge has to explain himself, of course. And as I will tell you in a moment, there may be more information that requires it. This from the Daily Mail exclusive. Prosecutors in the Kenosha shooter trial withheld high-definition video evidence from the defense that was at the center of their case, initially shared a lower-quality version of drone footage from the night of Kyle Rittenhouse shooting. Assistant DA Thomas Binger initially shared low-quality drone footage from the night of the shooting with the defense, The defense claims Binger only shared the high-definition footage after evidence had already closed on Saturday. According to a motion filed today by the defense, quote, the problem is the prosecution gave the defense a compressed version of the video, unquote. Quote, what that means is the video provided to the defense was not as clear as the video kept by the state. Lawyers for Rittenhouse filed their motion for mistrial 
with prejudice based on this and several other grounds. And they have many grounds. Many grounds. And I suspect, I could be dead wrong, but I suspect the judge is waiting to see what the jury comes back with, and he might. He might put out a ruling that neutralizes what the jury does. Who knows? That motion for mistrial is still standing. But you can't play fast and loose over and over and over again when you're dealing with a murder trial. You just can't. Somebody's entire life, their liberty is on the line. And this prosecution, I said before, I said it a week, well, more than a week ago, that this prosecutor, Binger, his ass should be dragged in front of the Supreme Court Ethics Committee in Wisconsin, where he has to defend his own career and his own license. And of course, anybody can file that, by the way. That's the truth. You don't play around with evidence. You don't play around with the Constitution. You don't play around with court orders and defy them. You don't do that stuff. And of course, you probably won't read that in the New York Times or the Washington Compost. That's, that's what I guess. Joe Biden has gone to Delaware on so many trips, and he's only been in office, what, nine or ten months? That his trips have cost about $3 million in Secret Service protection alone. $3 million in... Why does he keep going back to Wilmington? Hmm? Getting medical treatment? I'm just wondering. When will the media demand that Joe Biden release the list of the medicines he takes? Look, you're 78, 79 years old, you take a lot of medicines. I take a lot of medicines. You know, for cholesterol, for my heart, for this, for that... When you reach a certain age, you typically do. And uh, clearly Biden's taking a lot of medicines. Seriously. I think we have a right to know what medicines he's taking, if they have a right to know about Donald Trump's taxes. Now, why do we have a right to know what medicines he's taking? To see if he is competent. To see if his own doctors think he's competent to be president of the United States. Well, Kamala, will re- it doesn't matter who replaces him. We have a right to know if the president of the United States is with it or not. It's that simple. Because he appears not to be. So when will the media demand that he release the list of the medicines he's taking? You know, you know what he hasn't done? He hasn't had a checkup. He has released information about his checkup. None of it. None of it. Constant cover-ups. Constant lying. That's what we get from Biden. That's what we get from the media. That's what we get from his party. They're liars. They cannot be trusted in any respect. By the way, the truckers last night, I want to thank you all. Despite supply chain log jams, infrastructure bill allocates a quarter of a billion dollars to target truck emissions at ports. The Democrat Party is going to destroy this country. And by the way, Media Matters is very upset that I called out this Tiffany at MSNBC. I said she has really an aggressive hate for white people. Why, why, why am I controversial I'm pointing out what she says and what she is? Because Media Matters is a front group for Soros and his ilk. And I don't know how they have a tax exemption. Somebody ought to look at that. We salute our armed forces, police officers, firefighters, and emergency personnel. And all of you, thank you. By the way, great idea for a gift. American Marxism. Give it a try. See ya Thursday.